So we're working through a series we've titled Altered, and it's all about living our lives as a living sacrifice to God uh, and saying, my life is yours. What would you have me do? Who would you have me be? And we look to God for our guidance and our center. So uh, first we talked about living our lives just like that as a living sacrifice. And last week, Donovan led us through the open table, the invitation, this feast banquet imagery that Jesus talks about is like, come one, come all, you are invited. We would love to have you here in the true celebration of being together in the name of God. Really, it's all about, this series is all about being kingdom people, a people or a church who believe that we were created by a loving God and that we have a purpose and we have a, a, a creator who came to earth to show us the way and pay the price for our sins and then have victory over death and show us this alternative way of living, of being. Uh, and Jesus through his death on the cross and resurrection does something, heals us shapes us and emboldens us for the future, for what the mission uh, of the kingdom is all about. So being kingdom people, it's about bringing God's kingdom here on earth. I think a lot of the time uh, for myself personally, I think of God's kingdom is like out there or up there. And really when Jesus talks about the kingdom, he is all about bringing the kingdom to earth, like cramming as much of God's kingdom here on earth. And that's what Jesus' resurrection really unveils and unfurls for us all. So if we could get more of God's kingdom here, how great is that? In the book of Matthew, when the disciples asked Jesus, like, teach us how to pray. And this is what Jesus says. Uh, remember that if you have the Lord's Prayer, if you've ever recited it, is uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Great words for us and a great way to pray. Like, Lord, how would you have us help be ambassadors of your kingdom to help usher in the kingdom, um, a kingdom rooted in love? In the book of Matthew, in the gospel, there's also a recognition that the world is a scene of contending forces, good versus evil. Uh, and really people being held captive by it. There's no neutrality or that we just live in a state of it's all okay, it's neither good nor evil, it's neutral. It's not that there are contending forces and the powers of evil are experienced in the sickness of body and in the sickness of mind. And to pray that God's kingdom will come is to ask that God's power to create and heal will prevail over the forces that destroy and that his power to redeem will bring freedom from oppression. Now all that being said, all that kingdom talk, most of us have heard about or have seen the video of the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis and the resulting protests. Um, for a lot of people it's been quite the week uh, and for a lot of people it's been quite the life or that is a part of their experience. For some, it's life uh, with a political or a cultural system that doesn't afford you the same rights as other people seem to enjoy. So what does one do? What does one do with such a horrific eight to nine minute video of someone losing their life and the seemingly callous uh, disregard as people are pleading for the need to come off his neck. But that doesn't seem to be the way it played out. I was listening to an interview where the person being interviewed uh, said that peaceful resistance is futile. And I remember hearing that. And, and the person said, if talk could solve this, we would have solved it. He says, that is not the answer. And I was like, oh, is violence the answer? That goes against everything about the way of Jesus that, that I feel. And then he said, violent resistance is also not the answer, is also futile. So if peaceful resistance 
and violent resistance are both futile. Where does the hope lie? And here's what he said. The only way this changes is when people think, or people's way of thinking changes. And then when that way of thinking changes, their actions change. And then as their actions change, there is a movement that will not tolerate injustice or inequality. They will pick up those who are down and it will work to suppress those who rise above others to dominate or to exploit. And I just hear that. Right? Or one writes a paragraph like that, or one sees a great quote on Facebook or Instagram or uh, Twitter, and it's like you're like puffed up. You're like, you got that right, like preach it. That is so true. But then how long does that last with us? That's a great thought. That's a great word. But now what? What does one do? There's a word for where we need to begin. And there's a Greek word, and the Greek word is metanoia. And the English translation is repent. And when we hear the word repent, we usually think of, I need to repent. I need to confess my sins. I need to repent. I need to change my course. It's like a 180 turn. But there's an original meaning to that Greek word. And the original meaning is to change the changing of one's mind. It's like the changing of a worldview. It's the changing of how we think about things. And when I think of us being a, a kingdom people who live in an alternate reality, that requires repentance. It requires a changing of one's mind. There is this great quote, ignorance breeds fear. Fear breeds hatred. Hatred breeds violence. So if ignorance breeds fear, if that's the first part that we need to address in our lives, how does that look? How do we address our ignorance, our not knowing other people's experiences and stories? Um, my first roommate, uh, or my roommate in my first year of university was uh, a young man of indigenous uh, descent. Uh, his name is Vinny. And I remember we'd have great conversations in our dorm room and he would tell me about his life and his growing up and his experiences and, and, and we would just share stories. And I didn't really have an understanding. And he says, you want to know more about my experiences? And he said, yeah. So we went, it was while we were shopping, we went to the mall and we're just walking around. We don't have any money, we're students. So we're shopping, uh, browsing. And he says, watch what happens. And so as we were walking, I didn't even notice. And he says, notice that we're being followed. There was security that followed us everywhere. And he says, that happens whenever I go shopping. If there is security or if I'm in a store, I am being watched. And it was an experience and I noticed it. And I, I was like, that is new to me. That is usually not my experience. And he would all, he would get pulled over way more, uh, way more often than any of us would get pulled over by police just to check you out, just how's it going? And I remember as we're lying, uh, as we're going to bed that night, it's, uh, he says, you know, when everyone follows you and thinks the worst of you and doesn't trust you, it makes me want to act out. It makes me want to do things that they expect that I will do. It's almost like a self-fulfilling self prophecy of, oh, you think this is this way about me? This is how you, this is how you label me? I'll show you something. And it's very much that reaction out of uh, this oppressive system. And it becomes that self-fulfilling prophecy. And I was really aware, made aware of my blind spots for in, in a very new way. And I think that's true, especially when it comes to racial issues. Uh, and with that in mind, earlier this week, um, we were able to go to Winnipeg to Living Word Temple to the North End. Uh, and the last few years, I've been able to work with, with some churches there. And just want to talk to some of their indigenous leaders and get their experience and their stories about what are they thinking when they watch the video and when they hear of that and what is their what are their experiences so go back to the video uh it was posted earlier this week on our website go back and hear from those people their experiences and it was interesting how each uh, each of them had numerous family members in jail each of them had numerous family members on parole. It was a way of life. No one had, no one had a story that there was no one that had not been incarcerated in their family. It was just routine. And they had also, each and every one of them had either been a part of the foster care system uh, in some way, either had been 
a direct part of it or had children taken away from them or were working with people. They were fostering uh, kids of their own. It was just, again, a routine way of life. And their everyday experiences were so different than mine and probably most of our experiences. So we were given a little look through their window about what life looks like. And Jesus, we're going to look at a verse. Uh, Jesus has this, this, this epic sermon, Sermon on the Mount, the like greatest sermon ever given. And within that, there is a section called the Beatitudes, or it should really be called, uh, I don't know, just the most crazy ways to live, or the upside down kingdom, or uh, just wild and wacky truths. Uh, so in these Beatitudes, uh, in Matthew 5, verse 9, there is this verse and it says this, God blesses those who work for peace. Uh, some of your translations would, will say, God blesses the peacemaker. For they will be called the children of God. God blesses the peacemakers. Not the conflict avoiders, the peacemakers. And the Greek word translated peacemaker is used in only one other place in the New Testament. And it's in a slightly different form, Colossians 1.20. And it says, through Jesus, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace, peacemaker, with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Jesus pays that price, reconciling everything to God, making things right, all things. So through Jesus, God reconciled everything to himself, he made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. So it helps us to look at the very Jewish understanding of that word peace. And that word for peace is shalom. And shalom is a huge word. Uh, it is a word that uh, encompasses so many foundational truths about who God is and what God delivers in Shalom. And peace, that word that we use, it is, the Shalom is worth, is, is far more than, than that word. It's, and it's more than the absence of conflict. In the Old Testament, the word Shalom has this complex meaning. It means well-being. It means material, materially and physically and spiritually. It's like everything is good with you. A blessing of abundance is on you in spiritual health, emotional health, physical health. And in your lot in life, really, your station in life, you have shalom. And it also is between an individuals, uh, or an, from individual to individual, and from nation to nation, there is this concept of shalom that is just rock solid and beautiful. And it is always understood to be a gift from God. It is not something that just happens, it is a gift from God. There's this epic theme of making peace that we heard in Colossians just now, and this epic theme of shalom. Making peace, though, is different than keeping peace. Uh, you're peacekeepers, Canadian, Canadians are often peacekeepers. Our, our army, our navy, our, our people are brought into situations where there is conflict between two, and it's like, just keep the peace. Keep people from killing each other. And yes, hopefully making peace, but in, in order for that to happen, let us keep the peace. And it's, sometimes parenting is like that as well. You can have kids that are just scrapping and you can say, hey, that's enough. And you can keep the peace, but to make peace means a changing of oneself, of repentance, a changing of one's mind. And I can't make someone change their mind. I can't say, hey, that's enough, that's enough. Change your mind, love each other, hug each other. Do you ever have that? Where you have to hug your sibling, you have to hug your sibling and is your heart changed? Probably not, but it gets you out of a situation for now. Often that's what peacekeeping is, but peacemaking has this shalom element to it. This is, it is all good with you. Because I can't change the heart of the combatants. It's, shalom is not something that can be imposed from the outside. It is this internal movement, this internal repentance. Jesus also clearly shows that peacemaking has a cost. Uh, Jesus couldn't make peace, that Colossians 2.10. He could not make peace by being aloof or distant or just hope for the best. Jesus engaged. He engaged with the cost of his life. To the cost of great pain, Jesus engaged and then conquers death. You'll hear that theme often 
uh, from week to week here because it's a central theme to a follower of, of Jesus that Jesus paved the way for us. It's not in my own power. It is only through the power of Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, that we can accomplish these kingdom tasks with Jesus and for the kingdom. Jesus knows, knew that we would need strength. If you go to Matthew 10, Matthew 10 is just this incredible chapter of this is not going to be easy. Jesus is sending his disciples out. And Matthew 10, I think it's verse uh, 16 or 17. Uh, he says this, it's going to be like, you need to rely on people's hospitality. People are not going to receive you well. This is just a really difficult message. And he says, uh, verse 16, he says, look, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. So be as, I love this verse, be as shrewd as snakes. Be as shrewd as a snake and harmless as a dove. You're talking about a peaceful protest or a violent protest. There's like something there to have the wisdom to be shrewd, but still keep your innocence. Jesus was absolutely all about peace, shalom. It didn't mean he was weak. It didn't mean he didn't flip over a table uh, of the lenders in the temple. When, it was, when that space was being misused to gain money and not to be a sacred space, it's not like he never got angry, but he seemed to get angry at the right things in the right way. So it's not like we just drift and it's all good. It'll all be okay. We pray our way through it. There's something about absolutely rooted in prayer, but to be an advocate for people was central to Jesus, his healing ministry. Because Jesus knew the world would not welcome the inbreaking of peace with open arms. He knew there'd be resistance to the wholeness of the salvation message. And that's why he says surprisingly in that, in that chapter in Matthew 10, among other things that he says, he says this, uh, don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. Well, what? What does that mean? He absolutely came to bring peace. That We continually hear that Jesus came to bring peace. But here in Matthew 10, 34, he says, don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. And sometimes that verse gets flipped or gets taken out of context, I think. And uh, it's used for a just war. Or There's probably a, a 10 part sermon series we can do on that verse. Maybe we should. But for today, I'm just going to take us to a place of that sword is, it feels like if you look at the rest of the chapter earlier in chapter 10, it is a sort of division. This isn't going to be easy. This is not going to be a smooth, easy process that re does not require anything of you. It may require everything of you. This path of peace, this gospel message may require everything. And it's all because of how deeply humanity, humanity can and does fight and resist the goodness and the peace of God. That's the oldest story in the book, back to Genesis, is that we will fight, we will resist. And only through the truth, the repentance, the changing of one's mind, do I truly understand the mission of Jesus and how this earth is to be redeemed and we are partners in it. As a church at Westside, we've talked about the gospel message in one word, Jesus. If someone had to ask you, what is the gospel message, we would say Jesus. In three words, if you had to say the gospel message in three words, you would say Jesus is Lord. And this is from a book called Reunion uh, that we walk through in fall. And in 30 words, we would say this, Jesus is God with us. He came to show us God's love, to save us from sin, to set up God's kingdom and shut down religion, the rules, that it's all about rules. It's about a way, it's about Jesus. I added that part. I've now made it more than 30 words. And it ends with, so we can share in God's mission, in God's love. That video of a man with his knee on the neck of another man is so hard to watch truly is heartbreaking and you're like you've heard from other people you just want to scream at the screen like let him up like people were screaming like let him up like I can't like he can't breathe you're killing that dude he needed oxygen and oxygen oxygen was refused him and I heard 
uh, another interview from a, an attorney in, uh, from the States, and he says, George needed oxygen, and we need to understand how we can bring oxygen or how we are cutting off oxygen to people through our systems, through our culture. We need to understand and be aware enough, and for that to happen, we have to lose or be healed from our ignorance. And to be healed from our ignorance means that we go ask questions, we seek out those who are different from us, and we say, what is your experience? And there is a humility to it that is front and center. And you will hear that throughout this Altered series. We're just, we have just been continually reminded as we work through it that this all starts with humility, that we don't think of ourselves as higher than others. And we lift those up who have been beaten down. And you think of that gospel message of Jesus, Jesus is Lord. And you think of it, and that is a life-giving message. That gives oxygen to our soul, that gives oxygen to our relationships, and it should also give oxygen to systems. To systemic racism, the answer to that is to breathe life, God-fearing life, into people by standing up for injustice. So what does that look like for us? Well, we're gonna start with learning. We're gonna start with the renewing of our mind. Let's start with repentance. But then we cannot just, a changing of one's mind once we've truly changed our mind or have a new way about us, it has to lead to action. That's the biggest fear I have is that we have some big thoughts and you know, I don't want to sign over my office. This is where good ideas go to die. We need to breathe life into people, into ideas, and into healthy, godly, life-affirming systems. Because that's, as, as ambassadors of Christ, is who we are called to be. And that's a life-giving message. And it starts with us, with those who are seen as in power. And it's up to us to give up power and to empower others who do not have it. And we're gonna talk about this more next week as well. And it begins with discussion and dialogue with those whose perspectives we may not understand. It begins with attending to our ignorance so that, may we, be, so that we may be informed and then transformed. So may we have the humility to learn from others. May we have the commitment and, the, and even the desire to stand up for those who don't have a voice. And may we be the church, may we be the people who carry out the message, who stand up for injustice, and who will not tolerate people who have been knocked down, beaten up, and have been oxygen deprived. Go with God, you are so needed. God loves you.